And today we're going to start a brand new series called The Great Exchange. And it's just so apt that we're starting it on this particular weekend. And, um, and it's really to introduce you to, to and equip you with the basics of, of Christian doctrine, especially when it comes to the doctrine of salvation. Now, there's one word that is used for this doctrine of salvation is the word soteriology. Uh, it's broken up into two words, soter and logos. Now, the word soter means savior, deliverer, and logos means word and speech. Um, and so soteriology is we can look at the doctrine of salvation as recorded in the scripture. And it's about uh, Paul writing to, to uh, this particular church in Ephesians, and he shares some mysteries with us. It's like God's secret is being revealed to you and I. And it looks at the position of, of believers in Christ. Say in Christ. And so today we're going to be looking at the salvation plan. Now, how many of you have ever put together a, a trip either around New Zealand or Europe or Australia, but you and your wife or you yourself, you spend hours planning a long trip? Any of you have planned a long trip? How many of you know it takes massive effort in planning? And I, as I was looking on the internet for, for long trips, I thought, Man, imagine if we traveled around the United States uh, and followed this particular trip. And you're in every place you go to, there is a, a place that uh, there are things of interest, there are things that you want to do, and um, there's just so much happening. And, and you put uh, maybe a year into planning a trip, and then you don't do it. Can you imagine all of that? But this is, this is what God has done. God, in the beginning of time, he, he planned the history of mankind. He planned the history of the world. He knew everything from A to Z, from the Alpha to the Omega, from the beginning to the end, that, uh, that, that God knew exactly everything that was going to happen. God was never, ever surprised. You know, when you make a mistake, God's not surprised. He knew you were going to do it. When Earth, when, when Christchurch had its shaking a little while gap back, guess what? God knew it. In the Garden of Eden, when Eve um, took her MacBook Pro and ate the apple, guess what? God knew it. God was, God's never surprised because he planned the journey he planned the trip from the beginning to the end. He knew when you were going to be born. He wasn't surprised by you. He didn't say, oh my goodness, yes, Francis being born. I didn't plan anything for Francis. He knew it. He knew what Freddie was going to do. He knew what Freddie's career was going to be. He knew that he's going to study megatronics. Do you know what that means? It's mega, dealing with electronics. God is never surprised. Send to the person next to you say, God's never surprised. You're not an off afterthought. And we're going to look at Ephesians, and we're going to have a look at how Paul is, uh, wrote to the church in Ephesus. And we're going to start off with verse 3. Verse 1 and 2, he always talks about greeting. You know, if we, use, if we use common language like we use today, and if it's the young people, you know, it's all, it's all abbreviated. He might have started off by saying LOL. And this is what he says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy 
and without blame before him in love. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. Oh, that passage is rich. It's rich with information. The question I want to ask you is, how do people get saved? You know, some people are very skeptical about the Christian formula that we read in Romans chapter 10, verse 9. How do we get saved? Remember this, we're looking at the doctrine of salvation, soteriology. And we're looking at how we get saved. It's according to what's written. Romans 10, verse 9 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You know, our heart, it, we can try and work it out as a, uh, in, in every way possible, it boils down to this simple truth, that if we confess with our mouth that the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you believe in the power of what happened this weekend, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, if you believe it in your heart and confess it with your mouth, the Bible says you will be saved. There's nothing more you can do. It's not how much money you give to the building fund that will give you uh, get you through to heaven. It's not you hel helping Auntie Sarah across the street with her little, little dog that's blind in the one eye that's going to get you saved. Very simply put, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, the Bible says you will be saved. There's nothing more to add to that. How many of you have ever been to a beautiful, amazing wedding? Look, I have been to, let me something, you know, being a, a marriage celebrant, I have been to so many weddings, and they've been absolutely amazing. I'm truly blessed to be able to attend weddings. And I mean, just look at that spread. Looks amazing. I am sure there's spare ribs that they're going to serve there. I, 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 I think there's going to be hors d'oeuvres and hors d'oeuvres. There's main course. This dessert, and my favorite dessert, I'm sure it's going to be there, sticky date pudding, a nice glass of red, Ribena. Look, we're in church now, so I've got to use Ribena. Guess what? You and I go to a wedding, and we just enjoy it. None of us have to work to make sure that that happens. And that's the same way with the salvation plan. God has planned it all for us. He put in the hard yards. He created the heavens and the earth. He created the world. He created you. And, and, and he created everything. And so part of the salvation plan is to enjoy what God has planned for us. It's like going to a wedding. And guess what? You walk away. You don't even have to pay. There's no invoice under the plate. You enjoy it. This is what I love about what Paul is saying to the church in Ephesus. And here Paul sketches for us the process of salvation from God's perspective. He takes us back to the beginning of time and understanding our, our salvation plan that's been ordained right from the beginning. It wasn't all of a sudden in at the end of Malachi God thought, oh my heck, this, what's happening to this earth? These people have no idea. They are sinners. They are disobedient. Let me think of plan B. Let me send, please send Jesus now to the earth. Jesus was always part of God's plan. Good Friday was always part of God's plan. Easter Sunday, the resurrection was always God's plan. Uh, Jesus ascending into heaven was always part, part of God's plan. It wasn't plan B or plan C or plan D. It was God's plan for the world. Some, some commentators have said that Ephesians is called the Alps of the New Testament or, or, the, or the Grand Canyon of Scripture. 
Because we need to see things from God's perspective. Amen? Are you ready? Now, this is a big word. I have 20 minutes to talk about predestination. And let me tell you, there are people here that believe so many different things about this word. I'm not going to get into a debate about it. I'm going to talk about what Paul said in Ephesians. The Grand Canyon of Scripture. Predestination or election. And it's in its simplest definition is God knows the choices people will make. God's not surprised by your choices. God knows who's going to be in heaven with him one day. God knows, God knows that there's somebody here, there might be people here who, who will decide not to follow Jesus Christ in the future. God's not surprised. You see, salvation rests completely on the work of God, not on the unsteady foundation of human effort. Ephesians 1 verse 4 says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of the glory of His grace and by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. This is what predestination means to you. Are you ready? What does predestination mean to you? You see, very often people think, well, if it's predestined, I can live like a sinner today because God, God knows where I will be. And they think, well, I can just sin, I can have 26 wives, 300 concubines, and two porcupines and everything. And you know what? Uh, because God knows my choices, and so I'm just going to live the way because he'll decide where I am in, at the end. No, no, no. God did not make robots. He made us with a choice. He knows the choices you're going to make, but he's still given us the freedom to make a choice. The same way you made a choice to be here this morning. God knew you were going to be here. God didn't wake up this morning and think, oh, my hair come. Um, uh, let me pick on somebody here. Rob's going to be in church. I didn't plan for Rob to be here this morning. Oh, I thought he was going to sleep in. And over. God knew you were going to be here. Just know you can never surprise God because he's all-knowing. He knows your very thoughts right now. He's thinking, that you're already thinking about your lunch. Guess what? He knows what you're thinking. That's the incredible thing about God. You know what you do in secret, God knows? You can't close the doors, close the curtains and think, well, nobody's watching me, so guess what? I can do what I want to do. God knows. He's not surprised and saying, oh, my goodness, why is this guy doing this stupid stuff? That's our daddy. So what does predestination mean to you and I today? Remember, Paul wrote to the church. He wrote to the church, and he writes the same letter to you and I. The book of Ephesians is as applicable to you and I as it was to the church in Ephesus thousands of years ago. This is what he says. God chose you to be holy and blameless. God chose you to be holy and blameless. This is what it says. It says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. You see, the very first thing I read here is that God has chosen us. Turn to the person next to you and say, God has chosen me. I think one of the cruelest things in school, and I remember being a teacher at school, and I would observe this, and I, would, I attended school, is that in a PT class or a physical education class, you know, they get the group of 20 boys out, and all in their little shorts, bare feet, vests, and we're going to play a game of soccer. 
and then they'll pick up these boys. They'll say, Richard and Peter, right, you now the captains. You choose. And then you see these little boys that are skinny like me. I had no meat on me. And I'm thinking, please choose me first. Please choose me first. Or you get a nice roly-poly boy. And he's thinking the same thing. Please choose me. I don't want to be the last one. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Were you in that same situation? And then the captains would choose. All right, I want that one. Okay, all right. Why is he not choosing me? And then the last minute, there are times they chose me. Don't cry. And I think that's the worst thing to do at schools. Because you know what effect that has on people? As this little boy, I tell you, I was so badly affected by that. Maybe I need to come to Colleen's disappointed class and get healing from stuff many years ago. You see, God, before the foundation, when he chose, he didn't say, you, 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 you. He chose us all. He chose us all. We choose to ignore and walk away. If it was that God made us all robots, then he would have not given us a choice. But when I read my Bible, he does choose us. And it's what we do with it. And the question is, he's chosen you. Turn to the person next to you and say, you better believe it, he's chosen you. And so when he chooses us, and I believe that I've been chosen by God, And if I'm chosen, what's the fruit? What should people see in my life? It says we should be holy. What does the word holy mean? It means to be set apart. I should live my life set apart from what the world has to offer. You will never see me in Manchester Street lying in there, lying in the gutters, intoxicated and drug and and, and full of alcohol and with drugs. You'll never see me. Doing that. Why? I have chosen to be set apart. It's a choice we make. It's the choice the way I live my life. It's a, it's a choice when I say set apart. When it comes to raising finances, I'm going to be the first one to sow. Because God has done a work in my life. It's setting apart for the things of God. Building the house of God for the generations to come. It's being set apart. It's being holy. It's been holy body, mind, soul, and spirit. Why? Because I'm chosen. But guess what? You are also chosen. It's just not because I do this full time. Guess what? If I was working in the business world, I would behave exactly the same way. Because I know I'm chosen. You are chosen. And then it says, and without blame before him. Free from blemish. What's, what's without blame, free from blemish? How many of you would take a leg of lamb that you've bought from Countdown or Pack and Steel? And when you cut it, the maggots in there. How many of you get excited and say, I can't wait to eat this? I can't wait to put this in the barbecue? Because maggots are protein. You see, without blemish means there's no marks. There's nothing. It's pure. And that's why I love this white, this white uh, sheet being draped on the cross. Because what Christ did on Calvary makes us pure. It makes us pure. On Friday, we had the red one on. Don't know how many of you notice. I notice. The red was the blood shed on Calvary for you and I. The white speaks of purity. That's being free and blameless. And he gave himself for us. Christ gave himself for us. That's what we celebrated and remembered this weekend. That he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people. We are part of God's special people. 
We are part of God. So what he did on the cross was for you and I. He didn't do it for himself. Jesus didn't do it and say, oh, now you can go to heaven and say, hey, you know what I did? I died on the cross for some people who don't really want it. He didn't do that. To purify himself for his own special people. You and I form part of his own special people. Zealous for good works. Number two. God chose you to be adopted into his family. He predestined you for adoption. It says, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. You know, in the Old Testament, God is called Father only 14 times. Now, I have not gone through the whole uh, Old Testament, and I've not underlined it, I didn't count it. Somebody else did that, who have a passion for numbers and things. In the New Testament, and uh, sorry, and it's always reference to Israel, never to an individual. In the New Testament, Jesus called God Father more than 60 times in the gospel. 60 times. In the Aramaic people, There was a formal greeting and an informal greeting. The formal greeting was father. The informal greeting was daddy. And I believe God is saying something to you and I this morning. You know, some of you might want to be formal with him and say, God, my father. It's fine. But you know what? If you want to use the informal greeting, it's also cool. It's daddy. Our God is our daddy. He's our father. You know, just like my children. You know, Bradley never comes to me and says, um, Pastor B, can I speak to you? He never, he's never done that. He doesn't say, Mr. Vivigy, can I make an appointment to see you? No, he doesn't. Sometimes he'll call me dad. Most times dad. He never calls me, hey, father, because then I know he wants something. But you know, that's God our Father. And the other, and your Paul was saying, is saying that we are have been adopted as sons. And when you are a son, you can embrace God as your father and as your daddy. Isn't that exciting? So when you connect with God, He's your daddy. He is your father. First Romans 8, verse 15 says. For you did not receive the spirit of adoption again, but you have received um, the spirit. Sorry, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption by which we can cry, Abba, Father. Friends, what does this word adoption mean in this context? I'm so glad you asked me. Because most times when we think adoption, And maybe you have been adopted or you have adopted someone. We normally think of of in our context, our new, uh, our our context of of the modern world. If if somebody is childless and they want to have a baby and they can't have children, they normally adopt. Uh, I remember with, with, with Colleen and I in our early stages, we thought we would never have children. So we started the adoption process. We thought maybe that's God's answer for our lives. So that's adoption. But what what Paul was saying here in the context and his experience of the word adoption is that very wealthy landlords who never had children thought, well, who am I going to pass my wealth on to? I don't have anybody. I don't have nobody to pass on my inheritance. And so they would then adopt. They would adopt a male or a female and say, now I have a son, now I have a daughter, and now if I'm not here, my wealth will at least go to someone. This is a powerful picture when God says, you have been adopted. You are a son of God. Oh my goodness, I thought everybody would be on their feet by now. 
when we truly understand what this is all about, when we confess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are then adopted into the kingdom of God. We can now call God our daddy. He's our father. And guess what? We get his inheritance. Now, already you thinking inheritance, oh my goodness, how much money has God got? Because when we hear the word inheritance, it's always money. Let me tell you something. God has got everything in store for us. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit, and we are called children of God. We are children of God. And because you are sons, you've been set forth the spirit of his son in the hearts and can cry, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if not, but if a son, then an heir through Christ. I was thinking of this this morning when I woke up. Uh, how many of you were impacted by daily, daylight saving? All right, I'm so glad somebody came early this morning. Uh, so gracious. Oh, so thankful for that extra hour of sleep. Hallelujah. Think, think about it for a moment. Very often in life, you and I go through life as slaves. You know what? A slave is purchased with money. A son is purchased with the blood of Jesus. There's always a price to pay. Always a price to pay. But you see, when you are a slave bought with finances, you have to slave it out for the master. But when I'm bought with the blood of Jesus as a son, I enjoy an intimate relationship. A slave never benefits from the master. When the master dies, he gets nothing. But you know what? As a son, I enjoy everything that God has for me. Everything. Everything. Say everything. Number three. God chose you for the praise of his glorious grace. What is my response to everything that I've shared? What is my response that he's chosen me, that I'm a son of God, is that I should praise him to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Our response is praise. How many of you walk around the city praising God? How many of you go to the mall and praise God? How many of you drive your car and praise God? You don't praise your God only on Sunday morning for this holy hour. The hour of power. I praise God all the time. No matter where I am, I'm so thankful that I'm a son and I'm not a slave. I'm so thankful that he chose me. Friends, let me tell you something. I have no idea where I would be if God did not choose me and I responded to that call where I would be today. Let me close with this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. What do I have as a son? What's my inheritance as a son? He's blessed me with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Not some. God doesn't choose it. It's not like lotto. Okay, Bernard, here is 300 blessings. You choose. You allow 10. No, no, no. My Bible tells me it's every spiritual blessing. It's every spiritual blessing that God has for you. And it's in Christ. We go through Ephesians. We'll touch on it next week. There's so many times... These words are used in Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in Christ. Paul's trying to say something. And it's only found in Christ. How can I activate that? If you confess with your mouth 
that the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And when, when we look at this whole Easter story, God planned it right from the beginning. He planned for you to be here right from the beginning. He chose you. He chose you. I want us to pray together. Let's all stand.